is 3 p.m. Welcome back. Our third speaker is Dr. Steve Zhang. His talk will be focused on thoughts on the deployment of artificial intelligence in clinical practice. Dr. Zhang is a Barbara Crittenden Professor in Cancer Research, Vice Chair of Radiation Oncology Department and Director of Medical Physics and Engineering Division, and the tenure full professor of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Zhang is a Fellow of Institute of Physics and the APM. His current research interest is on the development and deployment of artificial intelligence technologies to solve medical Medical problems. He is the founding director of Medical Artificial Intelligence and Automation Lab at UT Southwestern. Dr. Zhang was the chair for several APM task groups and is a member of the APM Machine Learning Subcommittee. Dr. Zhang, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to share our work and some of our thoughts on uh, machine learning in uh, clinical practice. So let me start sharing my screen. Okay, can you see my yes. uh, slides? Yeah. So um, I had been at Mass General for seven years, from two, year 2000 to 2007. So there's quite some familiar faces or names here. So glad to uh, have this opportunity to uh, talk to you guys. Uh, I, I gave this same, same talk about three months ago, two, three months ago at the AAPM webinar. So some of you might have heard of this, so I apologize for that. Uh, so basic idea is, uh, uh, basic uh, uh, topic here is uh, uh, some of our thoughts on the implementation of AI in clinical practice, the challenges and uh, some of the uh, potential solutions. So first, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at the uh, Maya Lab, uh, Medical AI and Automation Lab here at UT Southwestern. Uh, a lot of uh, this work is from them. So this <laughs> was a very nice review article uh, from Brigham Women's, uh, and uh, they did a very good review on the AI application in radiation oncology. The basic idea is at every step of uh, radiotherapy, you can use AI to help user get a better uh, decision making or uh, better uh, image uh, or faster uh, contouring. So, so uh, I had a student who did a quick PubMed search, uh, I think last year, look at all the uh, published papers uh, that are related to AI and medicine. And you see uh, the number of those papers has been growing exponentially in the last uh, some years. However, we have not seen a lot of clinical applications of AI in our routine, routine clinical work. So the, apparently there is a big gap between the AI research and the clinical uh, use of AI. And why is that? That's something very interesting and important to me. So I look at the clinical implementation of AI. This is kind of like a typical workflow. Uh, developers, uh, let's say vendors, they have a training data set, they train their model. Uh, and uh, let me have the pen here. So they train the model and then they gave it to user after, of course, of you know, FDA clearance, CE uh, clearance. And uh, with all the detailed information about the model, they pass all this to the users. And then the users will look at the model and uh, apply it to their patients and get the model prediction. And then the user here called clinician could be a physician or a physicist or a dosimetrist, whoever work in the clinic and using this uh, AI model for their uh, clinical tasks, can look at the results and decide accept as is or accept with revision or reject, right? So what is considered a successful implementation of this AI model? In my mind, that is the clinician's happiness and acceptance, user's happiness and acceptance. If they do not like it, for example, if they have to reject the results every time or they have to make a, a lot of revisions every time when they use this model, uh, eventually they are going to stop using it. They will say, I'd rather to just do the country myself, right? So that is, uh, in my mind, that is the key for the clinical implementation of um, AI uh, tools. 
uh, for them to be happy and uh, uh, accepting the results, AI models, they, they need to, uh, your acceptance rate should be very high, approach to 100%. So in many AI researchers, developers mind, that the, that is a goal. We are going to achieve 100% someday. At that point, we do not need the conditions in the picture, right? If it's correct every time, why well, is someone there <laughs> to review your, the result, right? So that's the, un, in my, I think that's the unspoken goal of many, many AI developers. But in my mind, uh, in my opinion, that's impossible, uh, given these complicated clinical, uh, situations, right? F f clinicians are always needed uh, in the picture. Actually, they should be at the center of the picture. So why you cannot get 100% right every time? Uh, there are many reasons for that. One is called model generability. So essentially, uh, the data sets, uh, the distribution uh, for the data sets can be different uh, between your training data and also your test data. And uh, basically, a model trained uh, at hospital A may not work well uh, for patients in hospital B, right? So that's called a model generability problem. Uh, one example is uh, Google Research work. They published uh, this nice work in JAMA uh, like seven, six years ago. Uh, and that was a very nice work because a huge data set, right? Uh, using a retina image uh, to detect diabetic retinography. Uh, and also they have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, nicely labeled data. They have a, a very nice uh, uh, observer study, got wonderful results. So that's why it was published uh, uh, in JAMA. That was kind of like a uh, uh, very important work of that year in terms of AI medicine. So then they, when they apply this work in real world, uh, then they had some problems. Like in Thailand, uh, wanted to annually screen 60% of the patients with diabetes. Uh, without AI, it's impossible because there are too many patients and they do not have enough uh, retina specialists in Thailand. It also takes too long, right? So when they saw Google's work, they say, hey, that's perfect. You know, the AI can be fast, takes 10 minutes, take a photo, send it to the cloud. In 10 minutes, you got results, right? But uh, when they start to use it, they found that there are many problems there. Like one problem is um, in Thailand, sometimes the the lighting condition <laughs> can be poor and the image quality can be poor and then the model does not work, right? Then there, there are other reasons. Google actually reported this work uh, in 2020 in a conference. They did not publish it, but uh, that's a very good example showing the wonderful model you developed in a research lab may not work in real world. Another work we did, my colleague Dan Wen and, uh, and also uh, some radiologists at Utisa Swiston, we uh, worked on this a couple of years ago, when not actually a year and a half, when COVID started, uh, we were thinking of developing an AI watchdog uh, for initially for radiation oncology department. Every CT scan, we actually have implemented this in the clinic for a while now. So every CT scan uh, will look if there's a lung there. If there's a lung there, is, is there anything suspicious in lung, like a COVID uh, lighting pneumonia, right? Uh, and if there is something suspicious, there is an email sent to uh, therapist, actually a uh, clinical manager, he will take, you know, uh, certain steps uh, to uh, clarify uh, the situation, make sure this patient, uh, we know this patient uh, had COVID or had COVID before or has COVID, uh, if not, maybe a test, right? So we have implemented this AI watchdog in our clinic last year sometime. We were also working with radiologists because there are there are a lot of more patients there receiving CT scans every day on campus, right? So we got the first part of this project is to develop a classifier uh, between the uh, COVID-19 pneumonia and, 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 the, and the no pneumonia there. So we got a bunch of patients from radiology department here and also got three public uh, 
the main data sets, one from China, one from Iran, one from Russia, right? And we found something interesting. Like the model trained that using UT Southwestern patients, right? You got a very good uh, AUC. But when you apply the model to the other two countries, it essentially does not work at all, right? Your, your uh, AUC is like a random guess. But it's the same thing. If you train the model using the Chinese patient data, you got all oh, perfect results. Actually, they, they had a paper published, uh, I forgot, in Cell. Um, again, that same model applied to US patients or Iranian patients, I believe, here. Uh, same problem. So there is a huge model generalizability problem for this type of COVID-19 classifier. classifier. Uh, many because I believe even the patient uh, COVID-19 could be defined even uh, differently in different countries, right? So how to solve this problem? The current uh, mainstream wisdom is, let's try to uh, train this model uh, with uh, a lot of users' data, like local users' data sent to vendors, right? Uh, there are a lot of practical issues. Uh, you can do your best, but I don't think this is the way to go. Um, then another way is uh, um, maximize the model generability at the initial development and the training stage. Uh, there are many research along that direction, uh, like data augmentation or model architecture, make it more robust. Uh, again, um, it's not going to completely work. So the idea is, okay, I'm going to have one model uh, if I do all this. At some point, I'm going to have one universal model that works anywhere, anytime for anybody, right? So you do not worry about model gener generability issue, right? Uh, I just have a big question mark on that, this kind of strategy, even though this is a mainstream idea, but I think uh, it's not going to work for medicine. So our idea is called commissioning. Um, instead of having a universal model, we are trying to say, okay, at the development stage, try to make, yeah, still do all the tricks to make it general, as general as possible. But when you deploy the model, the users will do acceptance test, right? And uh, then they will test the model for local accuracy, the accuracy for your local patients. Efficiency, robustness, interpretability, bias, all the issues you need to test. Just like what do we do when you get a new machine, new planning system, right? You do acceptance test. And then if needed, if you find out, for example, the local accuracy is not as good as what the vendor claims, right? Then you need to do um, transfer learning, model commissioning. But it has to be done in an automatic way. It requires minimum amount of local users data. Otherwise, it's too much a burden uh, for the local users, right? Then after that, you need to do end-to-end -to -end, end -end test for the after the model adaptation. So after you do that, your model, your user's model is not going to be the same as the original developer's model anymore, right? So that means uh, there will be like all kinds of user's models out there, different from the vendor's model. This, this could be could sound scary to a lot of AI researchers, right? But in my opinion, this is uh, you know, what we've been doing all the time, right? The, like planning system, beam model commissioning for every NINEC, every institution, we do that. So this is a very familiar concept to radiotherapy community, but to computer scientists, for example, they will say, hey, that is scary. How we lose control of all, this, all the, you know, user models out there, right? One simple, simple example is like those predicting uh, mycotic Dan and I and others did this work uh, some time ago. And then uh, we apply this in our clinical practice to give patient, uh, physicians uh, suggested uh, directives for each patient and also reference plan for planners to use so that they know where to, when to stop planning, right? So I've been using this in the clinic for a while now. Uh, then when we work with people outside, like uh, Erasmus MC in Netherlands, uh, this is their clinical data. This, if we apply our model directly on their patients, got something very different. Uh, however, if they get, provide 20 patients, and then we can adapt our model to something very close to what they need, right? So this kind of uh, 
uh, model commissioning adaptation, I think it's crucial. So about this part, the summary is um, it's challenging uh, to obtain users data when the vendor developer uh, train their model, or even for periodical upgrading, it's not that easy. You can get some user's data, but I, like I said, there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, for that. Uh, also, I think it's infeasible to develop a, a universal model that works anywhere, anytime, for anybody, for medicine, for a lot of clinical applications, that's infeasible. So model commissioning is important, just like how we do commissioning for TPS beam models. Uh, developers need to make this process as simple, as, uh, as automated as possible. Um, now I think medical physicists will have a new role there. Uh, that's why I believe no one should be no one should be afraid of uh, AI, right? AI is not going to take take away your jobs. Actually, you perhaps will uh, AI may create new jobs for you. Like in this case, for medical physicists, we are uh, seated in the perfect position to do this kind of AI model commissioning, right? Uh, of course, some basic training in AI is needed. You need to know the basic, you know, ideas, understand how model works, its limitations, that kind of stuff, right? You need to know how to c collect the data, patient's data for the model commissioning. Uh, and you need to, just like what we do with the water tank, right? And data curation. And then you work on the model commissioning. You need to, after that, you also need to work work on the model QA and the upgrades because another research topic I'm not going to bring it here right now. We're working on right now is uh, a model uh, commissioned. It works perfect today, but you do not know three years later if it still works because our clinical practice may change. The image protocols, the scanners, the patient cohort can all change, change right with time. So someone needs to periodically QA the AI software tools, just like what we do on our Linux, right? So that's all added new tasks for our medical physicists in the era of AI. Or there'll be more, I believe, but this is just one example. I talked about QA, you know, patient-specific QA, uncertainty estimates, estimation, independent secondary sanity check, right, for QA, for AI tours, um, manual inspection, routine QA, um, you know, worry about unintentional modified models, uh, clinical practice change, I mentioned that, recommissioning model, a lot of research work uh, there. So, that is about the model generability. One big challenge when you're trying to bring AI in clinical practice, uh, and uh, I also proposed a solution there. Uh, another big issue is actually data annotation, or uh, I'll show you. Uh, so essentially, you know, you need ID very clean data uh, for your deep learning model training. But in reality, we we'll always have some more bias, noisy uh, data, right? Uh, a lot of problems there, but there is one problem that is called expertise errors, right? The inconsist inconsistency between physicians, observers, due to the human subjectivity. Um, I use medical image segmentation as example here. Uh, conventional wisdom dealing with this problem is number one, hey, let's have our physicians agree on the contours first before I use it for model training, right? Let's get a group of them sitting there looking at the same patient's contour and uh, fight among themselves. Eventually, someone will win, right? <laughs> will convince other people, hopefully. Uh, that's one way. That's how, essentially, that's the way right now. Many, if you look at all these papers, they will talk about, oh, we have three radiation colleges look at the data, you know, we have four people, that kind of stuff, right? Another way, of course, um, you can also develop, you know, different uh, architecture to uh, mitigate the, uh, even though you have noise in your data, training data, you can mitigate the adverse effect. However, my point here is sometimes we need to, we may need to respect the noisy labelings. Here is why. So I have this uh, cartoon here showing x-axis is physician experience, y-axis is a uh, 
beta labels, or you can call it clinic decisions, right? Uh, when among a group of junior physicians, yeah, the variance is large, right? You have this, uh, you know, large sigma here. With more and more clinic experience, this sigma will decrease, right? Among a group of uh, experienced physicians, they may, you know, more agree with each other. However, the point here I want to make is the sigma is not going to be zero for a lot of clinical tasks. It's going to be sigma uh, zero, which is not zero, right? Uh, why is that? Because there is a difference in clinical practice, right? In the practice styles. Because of that, we need to respect sigma zero. Can I just simply, hey, can we make it zero? No, you cannot. You have to live with it, right? Respect it. I just want to say there is an analogy between these two photos here because medicine is still an art in many cases. Evidence-based medicine and clinical guidelines only give physicians the floor, not the ceiling. There is a room, sometimes a big room, for physicians to exercise their own judgments. And also, therefore, variation exists in physicians' clinical practice. And a lot of times there is no ground truth. There are so many different confounding factors, right? There are difference, the difference in their clinical practice may not be able to uh, uh, manifest it among so many different uh, confounding factors, unless you have a clinical trial with billions or millions of free patients, right? There are also variations that are inherent, no matter what you do. They're always going to be there, such as the trade-offs between outcome and toxicity, between costs and benefits, like for example, for patients, you know, cancer patients. Some patients may want to live longer, even though the quality of life is uh, uh, shorter. They just say, hey, just, you know, toxicity, I don't care, right? I want to live longer. But other patients may want to have, you know, good quality of life for the, you know, rest of their lives so that they can, for example, travel to see the world, right? They don't want to lie in the hospital for two, three years or longer, right? So, so different, this is, this is just different philosophies and that also exists among physicians, right? Some physicians are more aggressive, some are less aggressive, right? Some will say, hey, don't worry about toxicity. Comparing to our surgeon colleagues, right? We're not cutting patients' legs. <laughs> so, some are more conservative. So this is, this is the inherent, this kind of uh, variation among physicians, right? You cannot just force them or force patients to go with just one solution. This is like a portal surface optimization, right? You, you always have uh, uh, different trade-offs. Same thing for cost benefits and so many other factors. So life is full of trade-offs, right? I'll give you an example, right? We worked on a project post-op, post the CTV segmentation. Uh, you all know this, and there's no post-it gland there anymore, so that there's no, you know, clearly uh, well-defined boundary by image contrast, right? Uh, and then you have to follow the clinical guideline and locate the relationships with nearby organs, pathology reports, pre-op, MR, all these uh, things to define your CTV here. Uh, there is a big variation among physicians based on their personal judgments, based on training, background experience, uh, and personal preference. Here I'm showing you four contours from four physicians in the same group at our institution, following the same RTOG guideline. You can still see someone wants to treat more blender for this patient, someone wants to treat less, right? So this is very interesting. Then we developed this uh, in the deep learning model. We call it uh, anatomic guided uh, multitask little work. Basically, you segment uh, anatomic structures like blender rectum to help you segmenting the uh, CTV. It got you know quite good results, and we compare this with our residents, right? So this is residents death score minus the AI death score. Negative meaning residents did not do a good job as uh, AI, right? So most of the time AI beats residents easily, but of course you do not want to say, we're gonna replace residents with AI for the initial countering of the CTV because there's a education component there. So how to uh, 
deal with the resident training in the era of AI. That's a very interesting topic. And we actually submitted the editorial to the journal some time ago on this topic. So then we did an observer study between AI and the attendings. Um, those are very experienced attendings. We gave them two controls, one from AI, one from themselves. Could be from this particular physician, him or herself, or from his or her colleagues in a group. Uh, but more than a year ago, so they do not remember, just look at the images, they do not remember this was his patient or his contour, her patient's her contour, right? 15 patients from their, this person's uh, patients, the other 15 from his or her colleagues. We asked them to score based on the quality of the contours. Uh, four, perfect. Three, minor revision. Two, major revision. One, totally garbage, right? And uh, also we say, hey, between these two contours, because they're randomly displayed in front of them, which one is the one you used for patient treatment? So we found out the average score, uh, if this patient is uh, their own patient, the average score for their clinic contour is 3.4, for AI is 3.2. So 60% of the times, they correctly picked the uh, right contour uh, for clinical use or tell the, uh, uh, the right contour is used clinically, was used clinically. So meaning they like their own contours slightly better than AI contours. But when they look at their colleagues' contours, of course, they did not know that was their colleagues. They gave 3.1 versus 3.3 for AI. So 75% of the time, they incorrectly said, oh, this was the contour used for treatment. So that means they like AI contours way more than their colleagues contours, right? So that's quite interesting. So it be, apparently there's a big difference uh, among physicians in countering CTVs here. Then the question is, uh, uh, is this difference, physician style, consistent and learnable, right? And then we train the classifier with 373 patients. Uh, with four, four from four physicians, we use their limbs, physicians' limbs, as labels for those patients to train the classifier. And we found out 87% of the time, if you give a computer a CT scan with a CTV contour, the computer can correctly tell you which physician did that work, right? So that means this physician style difference there is consistent and learnable. Uh, yeah, right. Another question is, is this clinically significant, right? If physicians here practice differently, who is doing better for their patients in terms of outcome and toxicity? So we did a statistical analysis. I found out, no, nope, there is no statistically significant difference, right? So that, like I said, there are many confounding factors there. The difference in that countering of CTV is not clinically significant. So then what do you do here? If you want to implement this AI tool in a clinic, if your model is trained by all the physician's data, you will give this kind of average contour, right? Nobody will like it. You know, everyone will say, hey, this is not what I want, right? And then they were going to ignore your AI tour. Your clinical implementation will fail, right? So then we developed a physician style aware network called PSA Next. So the idea is that we have a, this model has the same encoder, but has different decoders. Each decoder corresponding to a physician style, right? This model can be trained once, but with different decoders. So that we're going to give you each physician's contour from the same model. Uh, there is one example here. Uh, maybe it's easier to look at uh, uh, this uh, image, for example. Uh, this is uh, the clinical segmentation of this particular physician. And if you use the uh, population data, uh, data from multiple physicians to train a model, you get blue. Apparently, that is different from what physician wants, right? It's different uh, a lot of times. However, if you use this PSA net, we're going to give you this particular physician's uh, preferred, preferred contour, which is in this uh, pink color, right? So uh, you can see that agrees very well. So this kind of tool can be used to improve the clinical efficiency, right? 
we did the test with Mayo Clinic in Arirana, same thing. If you just look at uh, uh, this is their physician, this is UT South Swiss model, it does not uh, match their physician's preference very well. But with this PSA net, you can easily get what they want. Uh, another work along the same direction is, well, I still, when you do this kind of PSA net, you still need to collect data for each physician and train and do the commissioning, some work. Can we? develop something called effortless model adaptation, right? So the idea is, okay, now I have a model for segmentation. Uh, I give it to you. Uh, you are somewhere outside the, you know, my institution. So uh, your practice might be different from ours. And when you use it on the first patient, you got to read You don't, you do not like it. You revise it. You got your, this is your revision, right? We will grab this information into another AI model called the DDL. Prior get the DDL, DDL will learn, okay, there's a difference between your practice and the model uh, predicted practice, right? For the same, for the same second patient, the, the model try to use this learned difference to improve the results. And for the third patient, you can learn even more, right? Uh, you can, your improvement will become better and better. So essentially after uh, a few patients, you know, your, your model performance will become much better, right? So that's the idea uh, without doing the model adaptation manually or manually, you do not need to do the data collection. So this is kind of, you start to use anything new, but uh, along the way, you, your inputs will be used to correct the model uh, prediction. Uh, so I was trying to here is to summarize physician style awareness segmentation. So basically I want to say this may be uh, you know very useful uh, to deal with this kind of uh, sigma zero problem. That sigma zero is not zero. You cannot convince a physician to give up their own practice style. A lot of times they are very uh, insisting, arrogant, right? You know, they claim, everybody claims uh, he or she knows how to treat their own patients, right? Uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and also, um, you know, there's no evidence showing who is better. In that situation, it's, uh, my experience is that it is a mission impossible to convince someone to just, hey, you guys should follow the same, exactly the same uh, practice. In that kind of situation, I think the only way is to do this kind of physician style awareness segmentation. And uh, by default, you give this physician's own contours, right? So they just accept it. Most of the time, there's no revision needed. However, sometimes they may not be very sure, or maybe this physician is very junior. Uh, they may not be very sure how to contour this patient, right? Then with a mouse click, they will see all the other physicians uh, contours right there, right? Other physicians from different institutions, well known, well respect, respected uh, experts, right? So that is a good educational tool, too, in that sense, right? So, in that round, the benefit is uh, the practice will still con converge. Uh, so, this is another summary. Uh, of the model generalizability. Basically, you need to go to individualize the models uh, in, from user, uh, developer's model to user's models. The in, individualized models could be institutional models uh, or physician-specific or patient-specific. So I talk about physician-specific. Here is patient-specific. So we had a paper last year uh, called this intentionally Deep overfit learning, idle. So collaboration with uh, Yonsei University in South Korea and also my colleague Justin. Uh, the idea is uh, if you have prior knowledge, such as ART, adaptive therapy, right, for this patient, and then a, a pre trained model based on population data can be adapted, can be overfitted to this particular patient to improve the model performance for this particular patient, such as segmentation here, right? So, so in this case, you have uh, another CT scan with contours, aka planning CT and contour for this patient. Uh, and then you can adapt your model to this patient, 
Right. Another work a student of ours did is called a TTO, test time optimization for adaptive therapy. Again, you have prior knowledge here, right? So you have a population model. This is for DIR. And then you can uh, overfit uh, your model parameters for this uh, uh, particular patient, even for this particular treatment fraction. So you have a model for each treatment fraction, right? So you can improve the uh, accuracy. On average, the improvement is not much, right? However, the major uh, contribution of this work is to actually to solve the model generability problem. For some patients, a model may not work. Like some patients may have very bad results, but when you do this DTO, the results can be, that kind of situation can be avoided, right? Um, then there are more problems. I talked about a model generability, uh, many. That includes also the physician style uh, model, uh, problem, right? But there are other problems, uh, such as if you have a clinician in the middle of the system making the final decision, how good is this judgment, right? And also, if you need to do manual revision, if you reject it, you still need to do manual countering then how do you improve the efficiency and the accuracy there? So our new workflow here is uh, with this model, you do the model commissioning, right? Like what we talked about with this model, the first thing is the AI is going to, AI, look at this new patient will tell you, sorry, I do not, how, I do not know how to deal with this patient. And with the explanation why I do not know. So I'm not going to do the countering for you. I'm not giving you a uh, suggestion how to treat this patient, right? It's your job. Or I gave you, I'm quite confident, you know, how to deal with this patient. I gave you results. I tell you why I did it, did it this way. I also give you the confidence level, right? So all this information will be very useful for the clinician to make a, you know, informed decision, right? So then we have another AI, we have to revise the contour or whatever task. And then that AI will help you that instead of you do everything by yourself. Then there's continuous learning and model will keep improving, that kind of stuff. One example is uh, again, CTV contouring, we estimate the uncertainty of the AI results and we present it in this uh, yellow band, you know, 95% confidence band, meaning when this band is wide, like here, here, uh, the model may or may not give you a good result. Uh, but if the width is very narrow, the model is very confident. So when you re review the AI contouring results, you do not have to go through every image slide and look at every contour, right? Just focus on where you have these kind of problems, right? Another work is, work is called AI assisted contour revision. Uh, like I said, you know, AI gave you, for example, this uh, red contour, but you look at that and say, hey, this is not exactly what I want. I want this, what I want is this uh, uh, green contour, right? That's in your mind, right? So then you click here, you say, hey, this part has big error. I will click here, this is where I want. So AI will take this, another AI, will take this as the input, together with the initial contour as the input, to update the initial contour in yellow, right, into yellow. That matches very well. But then you say, hey, this part is still not very good. Let me click on here. So that's what you got, right? With two clicks, your dash score improved from 0.87 to 0.97, right? Sometimes the improvement from like 0.43 to 0.87, a huge improvement with simple operations, right? So, so we think this can be a very useful tool because we found out we have two issues here. We do a lot of online ART in our clinic. The bottleneck there is finishing, revising the contours, takes them a lot of time. If we, if we can implement these kind of tools, that would be a great help for online ART. So in summary, there's a big gap between AI research and uh, uh, clinical applications. Among many, many obstacles that I do not have time to mention today, model generability is a major one. And uh, given the complexity of the clinical world, I don't think it's a good idea trying to develop 
and universal models that works anywhere, anytime for anybody. Uh, model acceptance test, commissioning, QA, recommissioning, and retest are essential for safely, for safely and effectively deploying AI in clinical practice. Medical physicists will play a central role in this process, should be prepared for the added responsibilities in the era of AI. Uh, population models or general models need to be adapted to individual models, including institutional, physician-specific, patient-specific, right? AI and the clinicians should be an integrated system. They should not have this kind of current uh, serial relationship. AI is in our upstream. Users are like downstream. You gave me something, I either like it or do not like it, but we do not have this kind of uh, integrated uh, uh, system yet. So that's the main concept we were trying to develop called AI and clinician integrated systems. So thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Zhang, for the excellent talk. Yulia, I see we have many questions on chat. Let's address those. Yes, indeed, we have a lot of questions. Um, I also want to thank um, Dr. Zhang for her excellent talk, very thought inspiring. Um, so I'll start with uh, Ileana's question, actually, um, which is also my question. Uh, so the question goes, as a chair of the APM machine learning subcommittee, do you intend to publish a task group incorporating the up-to-date information on the subject as, for example, ideas regarding deployment and clinical practice, commissioning, QA, et cetera? I'm very interested in that. You know, I guess sometime I'll do that, but we can talk offline. If you're interested, we can perhaps work on this together, right? Yeah, I, I think it will be very important, especially as you probably know, we have a lot of uh, students and residents uh, at this meeting. I'm sure they will be very interested to know how to actually get um, expertise and understanding how to implement all this tool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. let's, let me then go to the next question. Uh, so the question is about uh, also about commissioning. How can you ensure a consistent quality in local model commissioning? You mentioned the TPS modeling analogy, but of course, IROC has shown an unacceptably high variability in TPS modeling quality. That's a very good question. So uh, I don't think there is an um, uh, easy way uh, to solve that problem, but uh, there are actually a lot of work should be done by the developers. Like I said, they should make this process automated and uh, as simple as possible, requires as little local data as possible so that you do not rely too much on the local user's experience, expertise, or or mood to do a good job, right? So so um, I, I think that might be uh, the way to go uh, if you, you know, uh, make this process uh, uh, very uh, much standardized and automated, uh, then, then, then uh, the variation will be reduced. Quality will be kept at high, yeah. Uh, maybe to continue on this topic, there is, I'm jumping <laughs> through the question. There is another question um, the, uh, that's from our resident. So he says, I like the analogy between TPS, B modeling and generating a user specific AI model with transfer learning. However, for B modeling, we have well-defined degrees of freedom that have a physical meaning, such as for the energy spectrum. Um, for the AI model transfer, how do we define which parameters, hyperparameters should be tuned locally and which should be kept from the more general model? Very good question. Uh, I, I, yes, you're right. Unfortunately, uh, we do not have a uh, or not even any uh, understanding of this <laughs> uh, parameters, hyperparameters, right? So you have to rely on uh, the you know validation testing, right? Whatever you do, you know, you want to make sure it still works, right? Uh, that's why you, you need to uh, also have an end-to-end -end test after you did that. Um, so so this kind of protocol for acceptance for uh, commissioning, for end-to-end -end test, 
it's not there yet. That's something we really need to establish. I have a very comprehensive uh, procedure so that we're not going to, because it could be re risky if you do not have a good guideline, have good protocol to follow, right? Yeah, I was going to follow up with the question to ask you what would be the tolerance for end to end test and how would we actually know that it passes? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have an answer for that question. Uh, it, it really depends on the, uh, I call clinician, that's clinical physicists, clinical physicians, or whoever, you know, use the system, right? Your judgment, it is good enough, right? When you look at results, uh, like one simple example is, let's say you have auto con contouring, auto segmentation tour. You know, you look at that score, that's what it gave you typically, right? Is that 0.9 that score good enough for your clinic years? Nobody knows. It depends on the organs, depends on, you know, many other things. You have to perhaps uh, perform some planning studies. Yeah, yeah, you have this perfect uh, contour. You have this contour with 0.9 or 0.8 that score from AI. I'm going to do a planning based on, let's say, the ground truth, and then depo cast the plan on that one, look at those metrics change, is that clinically significant, those changes, right? So you have to do something like that, I believe, in order to relate those kind of errors, you know, 2%, 5% errors to your eventually outcome, right, if you can. But at least the dosimetric metrics, right? Yeah, I think we will be looking for more publications from your group and others to guide us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, there was also one comment. Um, I don't think it's a question, uh, but the, the person writes, if the image quality was the issue, um, I guess he suggests to mention this as the requirement to use the vendor model. Um, as to mention this as the requirement to use the vendor model rather than use an inferior image, which would not even be advised. It is like using appropriate detector to use, to use SRS, SRT, SBRT beam commissioning. Yeah, uh, yes, I think this is a good question too. Uh, the thing is, it's not just the image quality, right? You know, you have a different scanner or different protocol, uh, the image features may be changed that may have impact on your, some deep learning models, right? We have seen that. So, uh, but sometimes it is about the quality. You know, in some clinics, uh, you look at their community, it looks very good, but some others, they live with much poorer image qualities. Of course, in theory, they should improve it, right? But uh, in practice, you know, not everyone will <laughs> be able to do a good job. So you, uh, a lot of times you have to uh, deal with that, right? I also have a question. You mentioned um, you did a large study on um, post-op prostate, I believe, and you mentioned that there was no clinical significance, significance in physicians' counters there were prior publications that uh, indicated that countering plays a big role in the cumulative error. So I was uh, a little bit surprised to hear that you didn't find clinical significance. So, uh, like I said, these four physicians are in the same group here at ETSAS Western and following the same clinical guideline, right? So they do still have a difference in their countering that is significant enough so that they are not going to accept controls from their colleagues, right? They have to use their own, right? However, not significant enough if you look at the outcome toxicity. But I believe what you're talking about is not, perhaps not finishes from the same group. Mm -hmm. There you have even larger uh, difference, right? So uh, that is the sigma. Uh, remember, if you look at a cartoon curve, that's perhaps the sigma on the left side. There will be measures, ways to, you know, reduce that sigma. But eventually, you still have you reach a, a level that you cannot further reduce it. That's what that's the one I'm talking about. Sigma zero, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. 
on the same idea, we noted this variation in imaging modality use, preferences, training, and this will imply variations in contouring among planners and doctors for ORs and for targets. Do you think that um, AI-based auto-contouring will solve this problem and eventually in the future can replace the clinicians for auto-contouring, at least for ORs, if not for the targets? Uh, ORs is uh, possible. A lot of ORs are reasonably simple, right? Uh, some are still quite challenging, uh, I would say. But I do not. I, 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 my, you know, the picture, big picture I have in my mind is uh, our radiotherapy treatments will be in two categories in the future or even now. One is like simple, standardized treatments. You know, it's, you can use machines like house and treat. 60 patients a day on one machine. Like it, it, it is happening on some institutions, institutions right now, right? So then there is a group of patients, I don't know how much, how many, let's say 20%, let's say. They require, they are not like just standard uh, simple cases, right? They, requ they require very personalized, very much personalized uh, care for each of them. They need uh, adaptive therapy for those patients. They need uh, replanning every day, right, for those patients. A lot of more work required for those patients. I think that's where that, that group of patients uh, is where, you know, AI may not be able to give you fully automated contouring or whatever, right? You need to have this uh, uh, clinicians involved. AI and clinicians is really working together as one team, right? AI plays like a, you know the role of a assistant to the clinicians, right? But there will be a lot of cases AI can just give you, you know, automated results. I believe that's true too, right? Not all the patients, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, if there's no other question, we'll thank you again. We'll receive shortly an invite to join a breakout room and Dr. Zhang will join the breakout session to continue the discussion with the attendees interested in deployment of AI in clinical practice. The main session will continue with the young investigators post the review.